My name is Eric Barsatan, and I'm the manager for physician relations and medical staff service services here at the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu. Welcome to our March Speaking of Health lecture series. Hope you and your families are doing very well in spite of the pandemic situation we are in. Today's topic is caring for our kupuna in 2021. In the past, we have held these Speaking of Health lecture series in person here at our Queens West Campus. But for now, everyone, for everyone's safety, virtual is a new format and we will continue to go with this format until further notice. So thank you very much for participating. We truly appreciate it. Right now and throughout the presentation, if I could ask all our viewers to be on mute. If you have any questions, please type your questions in the chat box with Dr. Utinko. I'm, I'm sorry, and Dr. Utinko will answer them at the end of her presentation. At this time, I'm honored and privileged to introduce our speaker. Dr. Mirna Utinko is a primary care physician here at the Queens Medical Center, West Oahu campus. She went to University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey and did her residency at Thomas Jefferson Hospital. She is a board certified for internal medicine and she's affiliated with the American College of Physicians. Her passion is in preventive care and empowering patients to make informed medical decisions in collaboration with the Queens Healthcare team. Dr. Yudinko's mission is to serve the West Oahu community, which she grew up in. During her free time, Dr. Yudinko enjoys gardening, nature, traveling, dancing, participating in community service projects, and spending time with her family and dog. So Dr. Yutinko is on, on your screen. And all of you should be able to see her and her PowerPoint presentation. Welcome, Dr. Yutinko. You may proceed with your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Eric, for that wonderful introduction. And good afternoon to all of you out there in webinar land. And thank you for being here today and spending your lunch time with me. Um, mahalo also to the team here at Queens West Oahu for setting up and advertising this first Speaking of Health webinar. Um, I, as uh, Eric has mentioned, I'm a primary care physician here at Queens West Oahu uh, since July of 2020. Yes, right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I see adults 18 years old and up and I'm board certified in internal medicine. Uh, right now, I'm speaking from my office here at West POB Building Suite 101, if you're wondering where I'm at. Um, and I'd rather see you in person, but this is the first time I'm giving a webinar, so please bear with me. I'll do my best. Um, okay, so the topic I chose today was uh, caring for our kupuna in 2021. And the reason why I chose this um, topic is because I think it's something that everyone needs to know about um, in this day and age. And it's something that's not really touched upon in typical um, education, including medical school. Um, so I wanted to learn about it and I wanted to convey what I've learned to you, all, the, all of you out there in the audience and the community, because I think you would benefit from the information um, I'm gonna provide today. So my goal today is to provide an overview of the care options for yourself or your kopuna. Um, again, this is a very complex and broad topic, but very important because it affects almost all of us in some way or someone that we love um, in, during our lifetime. Um, for the purposes of this talk, kopuna will refer to both our elders, meaning 60 years old and up, and any adults with disabilities that require care assistance. Um, I put this picture of the taro plant or kalo plant here because um, basically kupuna means to kupu means to sprout and puna means spring of fresh water. And the taro plant is supposed to symbolize our kupuna because they give us life. Um, and we owe it to our elders to take care of them in the best way possible as they age. All right. Uh, as a primary care physician, I wanna acknowledge that it really does take a village to care for our community. As we've seen during this pandemic, every healthcare worker and frontline worker is essential in providing quality healthcare. A PCP acts as a guide and navigator, but really it relies on the collaboration of all healthcare um, providers, um, as well as um, the community and of course the patient. 
The patient is of the utmost importance in co-producing their health. As Dr. Vivian Lee, who is a um, leader in primary care, has mentioned. So the patient is a member of the healthcare team and ultimately is the patient that drives all healthcare needs. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, someone who's on the line, who's in the audience. Um, she's a former colleague of mine um, and a healthcare professional and expert um, in uh, uh, long-term care assessment, case management, and now has um, providing the community with a no-cost senior care referral um, uh, service. And she, she's um, also a fellow Kapuna advocate that worked with me at my former job as a medical director. Um, her name is Rose Gallego, and she's an RN, BSN, and also RACCT certified, which is a national gold standard in um, certifying long-term care assessment experts. So Rose, I may um, elicit some of your knowledge during the, this talk, but I wanted to acknowledge her at the beginning because she did help me uh, quite a bit with the information on this talk. So the outline is, I want to give you some history on where we've come from, from the time of Queen Emma to today. I'll spend a little time on the history because I think it's important to understand the history of how we were founded and how healthcare has changed through the years. And also why this is an important topic in this day and age and why we, what are the top reasons for needing care um, for our kapuna or as we get older. Um, also, I, I need to define some care um, types and definitions. In particular, I want to define what level of care means. In our term, in clinical terminology, we call it level of service because this is an important concept when de determining where someone should be placed or what type of care they should require. Um, then I'll go into the more detailed care delivery types and try to categor categorize it in a such a way that would make sense to you, the layperson out there. Um, this is something that's very broad and technical. So we may have some expert social workers or um, RNs, case managers in the audience. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. This is more for the level of a, um, a layperson, okay, to understand. Then I'll give you some overview on our Medicare and Medi Medicaid um, and then go into care costs in this day and age. And again, this is um, an estimate. Uh, that's my dis disclaimer, okay? This is an estimate based on current Hawaii um, costs. And then lastly, if you stay to the very end, you have the benefit of hearing some of Dr. Yu or my pearls of wisdom as a primary care physician, which I call Akamai Plus. And then I'll provide you some useful resources. All right, so going back to around 1850, um, this is when young Emma, our future queen Emma, our future queen and founder of Queen's Medical Center grew up during this, this era. And I don't know if many of you know it, but her father, her adoptive father, her knife father, uh, Dr. Thomas Rook, um, actually was a physician. Um, I'm saying he's a, a primary care physician by um, what he did. Basically, uh, they lived in a house, um, but the first floor of their home, which was called the Rook House, was actually a clinic and a dispensary. So this is a picture of uh, the Rook House back in the day, um, and it's no longer there, but it's on the corner of Nu'uanu and Baratania. But basically, this is what inspired Queen Emma, the young Emma, growing up with her parents there and observing her father treat um, actually Native Hawaiians after hours um, at the clinic um, because there was several um, epidemics going on during that time, smallpox, plagues, flu, so forth and so on. And the Hawaiian population was dying off. Um, there was a nadir or low point in the population, the Native Hawaiian population in the 1850s. So this is how young Emma got inspired, actually was from her father um, treating patients in the community who did not have the ability to pay. All right, so healthcare then, this is where we came from. This is the Queens Hospital in 1904, although you know where we were established in 1859, 
Um, and it was uh, Queen Emma and her husband, King Kamehameha IV, who raised the funds to build the first hospital. Healthcare now. So we have uh, Queens Medical Center, and this is West Oahu campus where I'm located. Uh, this is the hospital side. It was established in 2014, and we are in Eva Beach. If you guys don't know that already. Okay, so to give you a comparison of Hawaii then, meaning I'm saying in the 19th century and now in 2021, that's a 160 year gap of time. Many things have changed in Hawaii, but there's some things that have not changed. For example, infectious disease. Um, as you can see here, comparing 1850, the 1850s, or 1820 to 1899, there were several epidemics that occurred that actually killed several people and the life expectancy was very low at that time. And I could only find 1910. That's when they started the census, uh, missionary counting um, residents of the islands. And it, the average age of survival was only less than 44 years old. Uh, the population is about 6,300. Uh, the industries that were um, supporting the economy were whaling in pr particular, and then later on agriculture, sugar, sugar cane. Travel was limited, but steamship travel started at that time. Um, and now here, fast forward to now, 2021, longevity is now double that, almost double, and our population is almost 1.5 million. Our industry, as you know, is tourism and hospitality, which has taken the brunt of, of the pandemic, um, and hopefully it will come back soon with uh, controlling the pandemic, as well as military defense. Um, and then travel being is easier now, and it's it's ramping up with the, hopefully the end of the pandemic soon. Um, uh, but we get a lot of air travel, a lot of immigrants from other countries, from the mainland, and so forth. So that, that's a commonality from before. We always, always had a big population of immigrants and uh, people from the mainland. So that continues today. But as you can see on our medical side, we have a lot more technology now. Um, we created a vaccine within a year, uh, which is like warp speed. <laughs> but there's a lot more chronic diseases and diseases related to behavior of patients. Okay, so obesity, for example, diabetes, drug dependence, and as well as behavioral health issues like major depression and anxiety. So we have a lot more to deal with in 2021, even though our technology is better. Um, so life expectancy has risen um, in the nation as well as in Hawaii. And actually, as you can see in this graph, from 1910 to 2000, which is from the Hawaii State Department of Business, and tourism, um, Hawaii has surpassed the United States, the, the nation, in the average life expectancy, and it surpassed it back in the 19, between 1940 and 1950. So we can be proud of that because life expectancy um, in Hawaii is like, is the highest of any state in the nation. So we can be proud of that. Um, how, the stats are such that Hawaii's older population, meaning 60 years and older, continues to increase. And one in four of the residents in Hawaii are 60 years old or older, so 25%. And it's projected that between in the next 10 years, um, there's going to be a 17% increase in the number of adults 60 years and older, as well as a 30, almost 32% increase in those 85 years old and older. So the picture is clear. This is very relevant. We're going to have an older population is driven primarily by the baby boomer generation. So common case scenarios that we can encounter in 2021. I just came up with a few cases that I see um, in my practice. Uh, for example, you can have a working married couple with school aged children and the couple is going back to work um, after working remotely. Um, but there's no one to take care of their elderly father who had a stroke in last fall. Um, and the father has mild le left-sided weakness, slurred speech, and needs some help. He's home, he's gonna be home alone during the day. So one of the questions is, will their father be safe? What are his care needs and what are his options for care? So 
So I call this the sandwich generation. Those parents and children of elderly who are taking care of two generations, they're in the middle. That's case A. The second case is a single woman in her middle years who's been disabled by a stroke and is wheel now wheelchair bound, but she wants to stay home with her elderly 85 year old parents for as long as possible. What is she able to do? What will she need to stay safe and independent? Um, the last case, um, KC, is 85 year old empty nester who's been widowed for a while, who's been relatively independent and healthy, but is having more difficulty driving and is caring for a large home with a 2,500 square foot um, home and a 10,000 square foot yard in Ever Beach. She has a limited income and consists only of a social security check. What are her options? So these are common case scenarios that are encountered um, every day. Um, by These are no particular people, but I'm sure a lot of people fit this, these scenarios. I just wanted um, a forum to talk about it and how to approach these, these scenarios. So as you know, anyone older than 50 or 60 knows that as you get older, you get more aches and pains. And we seem to need more pills to take care of more chronic conditions. In fact, one in three Americans have multiple chronic conditions in 2010. This is 2010 data. One in three, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, are common things that we see all the time. In fact, 80% of seniors aged 65 years and old report multiple chronic conditions. So disability is another thing that increases with age. Um, it can be acute, meaning it can be a catastrophic illness or an accident caused by an accident like a fall and a broken bone, or it could be chronic. And um, primary care physician, uh, internal medicine in particular, we deal with a lot of chronic conditions. And disability, although can last only one to two months, usually those patients who have some disability, whether temporary or not, usually are at risk for recurrent or progressive decline in their function. So um, they usually need more care. So the top reasons for needing assistance as an older kapuna or elder or disabled person are the following stroke and related conditions could be high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, something called atrial fibrillation, irregular heartbeat, smoking. Um, Dementia, as people get older, people live longer. There's some age-related dementia, but there are also other dementias caused by circulation or also things that can make dementia worse are depression and social isolation. Um, fractures are caused by falls or osteoporosis, poor nutrition um, is another common thing that leads people to need more care, as well as chronic pain due to, for example, osteoarthritis. And then the last thing I mentioned here is something called frailty, which is defined as a loss of functional, re functional reserve. Basically, you don't bounce back as easily from an injury or from overuse, for example. Related conditions can be poor nutrition, um, alcohol dependence, or alcoholism, drug use, of course, cancer, and also behavioral health like depression and anxiety. So because it's, as I've shown you, this is a big problem. I mean, a problem in the sense that the older population in Hawaii is growing as it is growing everywhere in the country, but more so in Hawaii because we live longer. <laughs> um, we're doing such a great job, um, but we live longer. We need to care for our kapuna and provide other venues to take care of them. So the Hawaii State Plan on Aging, which is part of the Department of Health, has created this 30 something page plan for the next from 2019 to 2023. And two of the goals are actually to enable the older adults to live in communities through access, availability and access, access of high quality long term care services and support, um, including supports for caregivers and families. They also want to optimize the health, safety and independence of Hawaii's older adults. So this is directly from the Hawaii State Plan on Aging. So it's very relevant to today. All right, so before I go into more details on the actual uh, care um, types and costs, I'd like to define a few terms. Um, in this section, um, 
level of care or in the clinical world, sometimes called level of service is a key concept in care transitions and in long term care and determining a patient's level of care. Of course, you know that this can change with time. You could be stronger at some time, get weaker and then get strong again. But of course, this means um, essentially you have more needs, you need more care. But how do we how do we describe this and how do we assess this? Okay, so I provided this schematic table in, in attempts to kind of simplify a uh, level of care, but it's a lot more complicated than that, but I'm going to use this schematic table to help guide you through the different types of healthcare in the in the long term setting. Okay, so what do I mean by level of care? So level of care is a spectrum really, but it consists of basic the activities to care for a patient who has some level of health care needs. And as you can see on this table on the second row, it ranges from someone who is mostly independent on the left side to someone who's fully dependent on the right side. And on the right side, you can see this picture on the left of your home, staying in home or aging in place. And on the right side, you can see a hospital, which is the acute care setting. For those of you who don't know term the terminology, acute means typically the hospital when you're hospitalized for some illness. Okay, so I want to define the, the second role, which shows independent and dependent, but there's two types, two major types of care called custodial and skilled care. Okay, what is custodial versus skilled? So this is another important concept you need to understand um, to understand long-term care. So custodial care is is help with things that we usually take for granted, the basic ADLs or activities of daily living. Okay, these are basic things that we do every day and we don't even think about it. For example, eating, chewing, swallowing without choking, um, communication, talking or writing, um, transferring, like going from sitting to standing position or mobility, walking or using a wheelchair if we need to or a walker. Toileting, going to the restroom um, to do your business, and then also hygiene, like bathing yourself, for example, brushing your teeth. This is called custodial care. So custodial care alone is not covered by Medicare, and that's the important concept that I learned doing this talk. Okay, these are things we take for granted, but we often need help later on or we may need like, help later on doing these things. Okay, then there's skilled nursing on the other side, on the more dependent side of care. Um, skilled nursing usually occurs immediately after a severe hospitalization or illness and requires a trained team of healthcare professionals like RNs, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists swallowing therapists, um, and it's usually provided in a facility called a skilled nursing facility or SNF, SNF, um, and they're required to provide 24 hour skilled care. The goal of this type of care is to optimize the patient to be discharged home, and I put home in quotes, safely, whatever their long-term home will be, going home. And thing, examples of skilled nursing are things like complex wound care, or complex medical management requiring, for example, IV antibiotics, uh, complex post-operative wound uh, care, post-operative care, rehabilitation immediately following a severe stroke to get stronger, as you can see in the second picture here on the right, and then complex ventilatory care. Those people who have a tracheostomy, for example, and need a machine to breathe. These are just some examples of skilled nursing. Okay, and then right in the middle, we have in the middle of the table, intermediate level of care. And this is a kind of a nuance where I asked my friend Rose, like, what is intermediate level of care? Sometimes we call it ICF level. So this has to do mainly with the intensity of the care. For example, intensity of the custodial care. Um, intermediate would be moderate to maximal assistance with these activities of daily living. And an example of moderate assistant would be assistance would be something like changing um, a di adult diaper due to urinary incontinence. 
that would be moderate assistance. And then maximal assistance would mean something like someone who is bed bound or requires two people to assist them to get out of bed. OK, um, case management, which is key, you know, uh, skill co coordination of the care will often be required in these cases and it will be determined with a face to face visit and it reassessed at intervals defined by Medicare law. Um, so the ICF level or intermediate care can also involve some skilled care, for example, like insulin management on some days of the week. So it can be a combination or hybrid of custodial care as well as intermediate care. I mean, skilled care, sorry. All right. So now I'm going to go through that chart by the columns and the different types of care. Now that you understand um, the different categories of care, um, I'm going to talk about what consists in each of the, the types of care, um, ranging from independent or somewhat independent to uh, more dependent or requiring more assistance. So the first category is called age in place assistance, or that's what it means, age in place. You want to stay in your own home, but you need a little bit of assistance during the day. For example, like it could be something like you just the daytime when no one is home, you need some help preparing your meals or taking your meds or something like that. So age in place assistance, there's different types, okay? Um, there's an hourly health aid. OK, who's not necessarily a nurse, um, but can assist with your ADLs or your activities of daily living, for example, brushing your teeth um, or eating or so forth. Transportation, driving you to doctor's appointments, preparing, uh, um, administering your medicines or even just companionship. And these are usually provided by agencies. OK, nurse our, our, our RN visits, RN or LPN visits are a little bit different, usually used on a, not a daily basis, but for more, more complex cases or if there's a change in the status of a patient. So that's another um, thing that is available in the community. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on in the talk. In the talk. Adult care, daycare is just like um, child daycare, but in a different way, but it's usually run during the weekdays, Monday through Friday, and provides care outside of the home while everyone's at work. Um, and it provides not just care, but socialization and group activities, and sometimes even field trips. Um, and simple meal, meal prep is another thing that it provides because some people can't chew um, things that are tough, so they need some preparation of their food or heating of their food. Um, and then the requirement for this type of adult daycare usually is that the, the client must be ambulatory, the patient must be ambulatory and not at risk for wandering outside of the daycare facility. So there are some requirements for that. So long-term residential care, which was the second column, I put this down as long-term, long-term meaning more than 90 days approximately. And there's two types based on the size, but more so based on what's needed, what kind of level of care is needed. So there are large group facilities called assisted living facilities. Uh, that's usually people who need minimal assistance with their ADLs. And then we talked about intermediate care facilities or ICF level, which is kind of moderate to maximal assistance. And then memory care facilities, which are better, basically lockdown units for people who have behavioral health issues and can wander. Um, and get lost and you know, escape from the, the uh, facility. So they need a little bit more um, security and care there. Small community-based homes, um, and they may be called differently in different states, are based out of uh, caregivers' homes who run these uh, care homes that provide between intermediate care to minimal care. Um, and there's different types, and they're called adult residential care homes. So they look like someone's house. They usually are run by one or two caregivers. Um, and there's expanded arches, which provide a little bit more intense care. And then foster care homes. And foster care is more uh, related to the payment of foster care homes. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about costs and payments. 
And then the third column on my chart, which I'll go back to in a little bit, is the short term rehab care. And I talked, I spoke a little bit about it when I talked about skilled nursing. And this, these are basically skilled nursing facilities or rehab rehabilitation hospitals. And they usually last less than 30 days length of stay, average about 23 days, and happens right after a discharge or, or um, discharge from a hospitalization or severe illness. And it prepares the patient to go home in a safe manner. And it's run by skill, again, skilled professionals, uh, nurses and therapists, as well as case managers. So the SNF or SNF have strict, strict cr criteria for admission, but basically provides 24 seven skilled care. And then rehab hospitals, like the rehab hospital at Pacific, is usually uh, uh, people who have had severe strokes and who have a great potential to improve with intensive physical occupational speech therapy. But they must be able to actively participate in the therapy for at least three hours per day. So again, these the focus for short-term rehab is to gain or optimize the patient's health care so that they can be safely transitioned to their next home or where they're gonna stay long-term. And then I have here right at the bottom home health. So home health are usually run by agencies. So if someone is able to um, get the skilled care at home and have caregivers be trained, like their family members be trained on certain things like wound care, home health agencies can be used so that the patient, instead of going to a facility like a skilled nursing facility, could go home and have uh, the professionals come to them in their home. There are criteria for this as well, but it is another option and also partially paid by Medicare. Okay, costs. And this is probably why most of you wanted to join this webinar, I'm hoping, because this is the information that's hard to obtain if you're not in the business. And I, I wanna acknowledge again, Rose Gallego, who is on the line. Um, from Elite Care Finders, and she helped me uh, come up with a lot of these costs to get a roundabout estimate. All right, first of all, though, before going into the numbers, I want to just give you an overview of what Medicare is and what Medicaid is in simple terms. So Medicare is the largest health insurance system in the United States. It's the U.S. federal health insurance program for people who are 65 and older, some young, younger people with disabilities and also people with end-stage renal disease who require dialysis. There are two major parts of Medicare. I'm simplifying this, but the two major parts that I want you to understand is Medicare Part A, which is your hospital insurance. And this usually covers inpatient hospital stays, your care in a skilled nursing facility, some of it, and hospice care, as well as some home health care, right? And Part B of Medicare covers your doctor's visit, like to see me, outpatient care, um, covers the cost of medical supplies, of medical supplies and preventive services, like for example, mammograms. This is a uh, brief one slide um, introduction to Medicare Part C. I won't go into, into it in too much detail, but this is an optional plan that a senior can choose to go into. And basically what it means is instead of having traditional Medicare, you basically opt in for a company, a health plan, a private health plan company, company to manage your health care, meaning your Part A, Part B, and it has its own rules for what is paid for and what requires referral or authorization, authorization and what it charges for copay. So there's some advantages in that it does cover some things more, and some th but there are some rules that are required. And these rules can actually change year by year, okay? So I'm not gonna go into this because I'm not an uh, insurance um, broker uh, Medicare broker, but I, I think it's really important that for those seniors out there, or those soon to become seniors, that you join a Medicare um, education uh, class because it's very important that you understand what your Medicare covers. And Medicare Supplemental has strict rules for enrollment and what the coverage is. 
And of note on the bottom here on the last bullet, it typically includes part D as in dog, which is your prescription drug plan formulary, which traditional Medicare, meaning part A and part B, do not include, okay? So Medicaid, and a lot of you have heard the word Medicaid, and it can go under the names of Quest, Integration, or different companies that manage the Medicaid um, insurance, is a way to get health care at a lower cost, or sometimes at no cost to you. But it's managed by each state, and the eligibility requirements can change from state to state. And this is a complicated area, but just to let you know um, that Medicaid typically covers people with um, low income, um, and then people with disabilities, for example, who have um, um, problems paying. So, but I'm not going to go into detail. I just want you to know the terminology Medicaid. Okay. So going back to our chart of level of care, I'm going to go into the cost of each column, how I, I defined each of these columns from the independent side to the skilled side. So age in place, long-term residential, and short-term rehabilitation. So let's go into cost. I'm going to highlight and go back and forth to this chart. So the first column, um, age in place, in-home care. All right, this is all private pay. It's not covered by Medicare. And in-home care is not the same as home health, which is, again, a post-hospital discharge benefit. Okay, which is in the more the short term or the rehab column, which is the third column in my chart. So in home care or hourly care aid would cost on the order of 20 to $41 per hour in this area. And again, the rate depends on the level of care. And the assessment on the level of care is usually done in a face to face evaluation by a nurse, a, reg a trained nurse. And typically, home health care aides uh, require a minimum of four hours per day or 10 hours per week for the lower rates. Um, the nurse in-home visit, a one-time flat rate, typically $200 per, per visit for an RN or LPN trained in assessing any change in status, um, usually more difficult patients requiring skills. Adult daycare, for that option, the people who need help during the weekdays because of family members who work and them being alone and requiring a little bit more assistance with, uh, for example, meal preparation or just socialization. This usually costs about $53 to $73 per day, but the client must be ambulatory and not at high risk for wandering outside of the facility and generally has a minimum of about a month obligation to get this kind of rate. All right, so the next category, long-term residential. And this one is action-packed, okay? Oh, wait, I'm gonna go back one. All right, so I'm gonna show you that this, I'm, I'm talking about traditional Medicare fee-for-service, by the way, that's my caveat here. Um, in long-term care residential, those are the people with assisted lit that need of some mild or uh, assistance with daily living or intermediate, moderate to maximum assistance. And again, it's the group homes uh, of care facilities or the smaller care homes or foster care homes. So in this category, the payment is either Medicaid, if you qualify for Medicaid, or long-term care insurance, if you bought, you purchased, purchased it ahead of time and something, this is an, another talk in itself, you may want to check with you if you're working, if you're human resources, if you can get long term care insurance for the future. And it's typically less expensive if you get it in your 50s or 60s rather than waiting till your 70s. All right. Um, and then lastly, red private pay out of pocket. And that's what I'm talking about in the next slide. OK, so long term residential living costs going from independent to more intense. Um, independent senior communities, about 80 residents or more, the costs would be about $51 to $6,900 per month. So it's quite a bit. Um, assisted living, again, 80 or more residents, $5,000 to $7,900 per month per resident. And then those memory care or lockdown units are higher, $6,500 to $8,000. Care homes, so that's that intermediate um, care homes either are expanded, um, and they usually have less people in the home, less residents, about one to five, about $6,000 to $10,000 per month per resident. 
OK, then we get to the adult foster home, which is similar to the care home, but is differing more in the payment because they accept they have to have at least one Medicaid resident and they're usually one to three residents and the cost is a little bit lower, four thousand to seven thousand dollars per month. And then nursing home intermediate intermediate care level around 60, 188 residents. 10,000 to 13,000 dollars a month and those are the people who need moderate to maximum assist. So, yeah, this blows me away too. Um most of us do not realize how much it costs to have long-term long-term assistant in a residential living unit. And I, again, I want to acknowledge uh Rose Gallego who's on the call um for all this information. Um and this is based on all her experience um, and expertise in the field of long term care. All right, so back and then now we're back to the skilled side, which is closer to the post hospital discharge skilled nursing facilities. And if you look down here at the payment level. This is where it changes. OK, more payment from Medicare. OK, but there are strict rules. OK, and they're talking about traditional Medicare fee for service, not the Medicare Advantage plans. I'm going to blow that up a little bit. So you can read it better. So days 1 through 20 after discharge from the hospital is covered by Medicare Part A. All right. So the first 20 days are actually covered by your Medicare insurance Part A. But after if you require more than 20 days in the hospital in the I'm sorry, this post acute or the skilled nursing facility. 80% is covered by Medicare, but the remainder 20% is covered by you. The client, the patient. OK, what is 20 percent? It's 20 percent of 500 to 800 dollars per day. And this is the standard cost at a skilled nursing facility in our state. Okay, for one day at a skilled nursing facility, OK, 20 percent would be about 150 dollars to 160 dollars a day. So that can easily add up if you get sick and stay that long. OK, and then days 101 going forward. There's no coverage by Medicare. You lose the coverage and it's basically out of pocket. Again, I want to emphasize this is traditional Medicare fee for service, not the Medicare Advantage plans. They have their own rules and they may have additional coverages or different coverages. So again, a reason to understand Medicare well as you get older. All right, so you all made it. I hope some of you made it to the end. Um, and I provided you some background or framework for understanding long term care and some of the definitions. I tried to simplify it a bit um, just so that you could understand how everything is structured. Um, of course, there's many nuances to placement. I don't want to oversimplify um, level of service that our team of clinicians do every day. But I want to provide you at the end as a primary care physician some pearls of wisdom and I call it Akamai Plus. Um, and if you look at the first letter of every word of every letter of Akamai Plus, I come up with a little pearl for you. Um, and it's something that I think elders or anybody can practice to have a healthy lifestyle and prevent the need for long term care assistance. Not that it will, of course, things happen, but it may assist you in your lifelong journey. So A is for ask questions and learn. A is for keep up with your screening and prevention uh, and also your vaccinations, including the COVID vaccination when you're qualified for it or eligible for it. Know your insurance benefits. So please go to a Medicare workshop if you can. They're free and they're very informative. Know your prescriptions and your supplements. And this is one of my my things. I like all my patients to bring all their pills to the appointments because you never know what you're going to see. And I'm talking about over the counter supplements as well, herbals, because there's many drug drug interactions. Stay active physically and stay hydrated. Um, M for mental health is just as important as your physical health. Listen to music and wear your masks. OK. A is for advanced care planning, and this is another webinar that um, maybe for the future, another advanced care planning is super important as we get older. Um, I is for invest in yourself and your future care. 
or your current care. Invest in yourself. P, three Ps, prepare, prepare for the future, prevent disease, and eat a plant-based diet. <laughs> so these are three Ps for plus. And then L for live and love life. We only have one life. We're all getting older. You understand that you and everyone else you know are getting older. No one's getting younger. So make it the best life. S is for socialize safely and save for tomorrow and save for your care. Safety first. And falls is the number one cause of broken bones. And if you smoke, please stop smoking because that's the number one thing you can do to improve your health. Okay, so these are Dr. Yu's Pearls of Wisdom. Um, it's not published anywhere, but I'm sharing it with you today. All right, and again, I wanted to show you the resources here, and you can get a copy of these uh, slides. I think Eric could send you it. It's going to be recorded, and I really want you to um, um, seek. If you need help, please reach out to my friend Rose Gallego. She, she's the owner of Elite Care Finders, which is a no-cost senior care referral expert, and she knows way more than I do in this area. So I highly want to I want to recommend her, and she's basically a Kapuna advocate like I am. We work together, to, and I, I trust her, and she only provides good advice um, for our Kapuna and our community. And these are some other resources that are provided for Medicaid. And Kokua Mao, which is a website with free online resources for advanced care planning, as well as our own Department of Health long-term care ombudsman. This is the phone number, Executive Office of Aging. So free information, referrals, consultation on any long-term care issues or options for paying. Again, this is a, a focus for the state, our state of Hawaii, um, to help our seniors find the appropriate care <coughs> placement to answer their questions and provide support. So these are my references. And lastly, mahalo for attending. Any questions, please stay safe and take care of yourself and others. Thanks for attending. Thank you very much, Dr. Yutinko. I love your Akamai Plus. So again, yeah, thank you. I learned so much from your presentation today. So again, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we'll proceed with the uh, Q&A or uh, question and answer portion. If anyone has any question, please type them, them in in the uh, chat box. And let me give you guys maybe uh, a few seconds on that, just in case anyone has any questions. Because Dr. Uh, Yutinko uh, would be more than happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Okay, it looks like no one is typing anything. So um, let's go ahead and talk about the uh, uh, evaluation. As we did in the past, you know, we do. Uh, uh, love to hear back from you and any comments that you may have regarding the uh, presentation. Uh, so we will go ahead and email you the, uh, the, uh, um, the evaluation. Okay, so if you can complete that so we can improve and also know what kind of topics uh, you would want to see in the future. Um, but since no question, uh, that concludes our Speaking of Health presentation for March. Again, uh, the West Oahu Virtual Speaking of Health series is the third Thursday of each month. Same time at 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Uh, tune in for the next lecture, which is scheduled for Thursday, April 15th. And our speaker will be our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Ron Kuroda, who will be talking about a related to COVID-19 vaccine for the West Oahu community. Look out for the announcement, which will include registration information. Uh, we hope to see you then, and feel free to share or forward the announcement to your friends, family, colleagues, and anyone you think may be interested. On behalf of our CEO and Senior Vice President Susan Murray, our Chief Medical Officer Dr. Ron Corota, our presenter today, primary care physician, physician Dr. Mirna Yutinko, and the entire Queens Medical Center West Ohana, Mahalo Nui Lua. Thank you very much for joining us today. Until next time, please take care and always be safe. Have a, have a good day, everyone.